Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Bill Shear. Uh, I'm Sandy's husband. Sandy, you want to say hi? Yeah. And Taylor and Cassie are here, and, uh, and Brooklyn and, and her babies are coming tomorrow because uh, Dawson is... Uh, what, yeah. Dawson's going to enter the adventure of his life. <laughs> because, and for you dads, I said this Wednesday night, the Bible says a, 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 a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. doesn't say anything about a woman leaving her dad <laughs> and cleaving to her husband. So I'm part of the package, son. <laughs> <laughs> Sit John. Chano got a new hairdo. Chano, you want to wave to everybody? Say hi. That's a t- <laughs> Feliciano Trevino, you doing good? What's the Lord doing in your life, Chano? Just reminded me that no matter what, our trust has to be in Him and His Word. Yeah. No matter what's happened, left or right. Yeah. Trust has to be in His Word. Oh my gosh. We walk by faith, not by sight. That's right. We walk by faith. Write that down. Chano says. <laughs> Walk by faith and not by sight. You know, this life that we live right now, and especially right now, and I'll tell you what's what's phenomenal about the last probably, I'd say 16 months of my life, um, is that it's just God that everything's come to light. It's like the enemy to our soul and the enemy to the kingdom expanding is in plain sight now, and, and not even hiding in plain sight, just kind of walking amongst us. And, and what, what I realize is the life that we live here is an open book test. So if you're getting things wrong or if things are getting jacked up in your life, it's because you're not opening the book. It's an open book test. I mean, t- there's not, a, there's not a, a time clock. There's not a, there's, there, there's not a deadline to this. It's just get, get the steps right. And see, and what steps do is steps then engage our lives into stages. And if, if you haven't been around the church for a while here at Guts, we're in a whole new stage of church. We really are. We're going through a stage here, and everything within me, I just want to extend this stage. That's why it's day 82 of a 60-day revival. And, and I, I, I mean, we... we we have to put ourselves in a position because, and I'll just, I'll just lay it out. There's, a, there's kind of a new cry or an outcry for spirit-led activity in our church. Not just activity. It's, like, it's not like, oh my gosh, I just want to be there. No, I want to be there because, man, God's moving in a, in a dramatic way, in a mighty way. And, and, but listen, this, this cry for spirit-led activity isn't necessarily coming from the pulpit. That's what's amazing to me. It's, it, 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 it's, in the, it's just in our DNA now as a church. And, and you have to understand that it's always God's heart. It's always God's plan to pour out his spirit. Amen. To pour, man, pour, pour his spirit out. That's, it, it always is. Because you, you look in the word and the Bible says, in Acts, the second chapter, it, it, it shall come to pass in the last days. He said, I'm going to pour my spirit out upon all flesh. And then he said this, and this is what's cool. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. He said, your, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. See, what this does is this brings back the concept, brings back the idea that this is family, that this comes together and it's family. Man, you think about it, man, when you're tucking your babies in, at night, and you're saying, God, I thank you that you're pouring your spirit out upon everybody in my home. And God, I thank you that, that my, my children, my sons, and my daughters will prophesy. They'll proclaim your word. And l- let me just tell you, the whole idea of this is, it starts with, again, with research, and then there's development, and then, and then we manufacture this to the public. That's what we're doing. That's what church is about. See, that's why the, the whole idea of, of teaching at, at church and even small groups and things like that, they're, they're great, it, it, but listen, it's not the be-all, end-all. 
What this is, is for us, this is, this is a, a team meeting. This is a family meeting. Why? Because we're going to take this to the highways and the, the hedges. And man, it's going to be the, the message that's going to come from, from our lives is going to be so compelling that nobody's going to miss it. See, we have, to, we have to keep the word in front of us all the time. I'm just telling you, man, not take a break from it. Keep it in front, at, at, as much as you can. Man, you're, you're either listening to the word or you're, the, the key to, to, to my life is the first two years of my life with Jesus. I was in my early 20s and I, I went to Bible school and I sat under the word five days a week for three hours a day. But then you know what, I went home and I had a, I, mean, I, I had a gift given me that was a, a cassette series. It was a huge catalog of, or, or, or a huge binder of, of cassette tapes that was, was just the word that was read. And I just turned that on. I turned that on and I'd make hot dogs and put yellow mustard on it and listen to the word, just, just constantly listening to the word. And I'd stop it and I'd rewind it and I'd listen to it again and stop it. And I'd think, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, why hasn't anybody ever told me this? But I was, it was all within the first few months of my walk with Jesus. And everything I heard, I thought, man, why, why, why has no one told me this? I remember when I gave my life to Jesus, I, I confronted a few Christians that I knew when I was in high school and then college. And I'm like, why didn't you ever tell me? Because I'm telling you, if somebody would have just said, make, make Jesus Lord of your life and everything's going to turn to your favor, I probably would have bought into that. And, but we have to keep the word in front of us. And I mean, keep it there. Where's, where's God's place in, in my life? It's right in front of my eyes. I, I've got to keep it right there. And then I've got to stay before the Lord. See, the, the, I, I believe a lot of times that even communion, the reason communion went from the old covenant into the new covenant, there's only a few things it did, water baptism, communion, there, and, and the, because the idea that isn't so much, listen, don't cringe, some of you Orthodox folks in here, it's not so much the elements, it's Jesus saying, look, as often as you do it, don't forget me. As often as you come together, as often as you break the bread of life, as often as you drink of the cup of the covenant, don't forget me. I'm going to be there. Man, you're in that, you're in that, in that consultation room with that, that doctor or that surgeon or that counselor or, or your CPA or whatever it is. Don't forget he's with you. Don't forget that he's there. So stay before the Lord. Number three, be accountable to and for one another. I, I, I tell you, it's, I'm accountable to you. See, and, and what's, what's awkward about my life is I'm accountable to a lot more people than are, are actually in my personal life. You know, I'm going to have to stand before the Lord and make account for your soul. Not what you did, not what you said, not your actions, but that you thought right. Man, I, I, got, up to, I got up today and, and, and just wanted to say, look, it's all about the authority that God gave Jesus, that Jesus has delegated to us. See, we're, we're expecting for Jesus to walk in the authority that God gave him when he delegated it to us. It's, it's like the owner hiring a head coach who calls plays and the quarterback expecting the coach to deliver on the play. See, he's given us everything pertaining life and godliness. See, what God's word does is it eliminates our excuses. It eliminates the opportunity for us to give explanations. Yet, you know what? Our flesh, man, is full of explanations. Oh, man, let me explain why that, that didn't work. Let me explain why I couldn't pay. Let me explain why my marriage didn't. Let me explain. No, you know what? It eliminates our, 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 even our ability to make excuses or give explanations. So we've got to be accountable. Write that down. Be accountable. And then finally, I believe that God's called us to take responsibility to shape history. But before you get all patriotic, let's start with personal history. Let's start that, we, that I take responsibility shaping my history, 
shaping my story? What's my story going to be? And you know what? For you, it might be an autobiography. To you, it might be a legacy of ministry or business. Or, but I'll tell you, we, what, what Dawson understands is Sandy and I put our foot down, drove a stake in the ground, no more divorce. No matter how much divorce is littered in our, fam- our family trees, not, and, and, and I'll tell you what's interesting about that is, you know, Jesus, Jesus spoke to different things. He spoke to a mountain. He spoke to a storm. He spoke to a tree. And that's a tree that we spoke to because it's like, oh, all these fig trees, and one of them wasn't bearing any fruit, and Jesus cursed it. And the next day they walked by, and that fig tree had, was withering. But see, what's interesting about a fig tree is that it's one of the few trees on the on the earth that the the fruit comes before the leaf. So if you're looking at it from a distance and you see leaves on that tree, the assumption is there's fruit. Yet this tree had leaves, yet no fruit. So what's it good for? Well, let me just tell you, that's family history that we have that's littered in all kinds of things that don't honor God. You know what? We cut that off. We curse that. God, I come against any, any foul spirit that's that's been attached to my lineage and my family. And God, instead of having a generational curse, I make a generational choice in the name of Jesus. See, that's where we have to go with this. And that's what we have to understand. See, what this boils down to 100%, think differently. We can't think the way we've been programmed to think. We, think, we can't think the way the world's tried to jam us up to think. The disciples' first thought that coming into the kingdom, their first thought coming into the kingdom, this is amazing. Who's, who's the greatest? Who's going to be the, who's the greatest among us? And they had all of this new life in front of them. And, and now their life finally mattered. And their thought was, which one of us are the greatest? Because they had a new lease on life. They had a brand new opportunity. They didn't, have, they didn't have all of the shipwreck and torment and failure of their past. Now they were, they were coming into this new life. But so what did Jesus have to do? Like coming into it, and this is the hard thing about, about d- discipling people and discipleship, is it requires adjustments. And those adjustments come in the form of pruning. And that's what God does. Open your Bibles to Luke, the ninth chapter. Hopefully you brought your Bible to church or you have a photographic memory and you have it committed to memory. But then for the rest of us, be an example and just open your Bible or turn it on. I guess you turn on your Bible. Um, Verse one in Luke nine says, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority. Underline, highlight, power and authority. Write that down. What did he give? Power and authority. Power and authority. Over all demons, now listen, and to cure diseases. He didn't just give them the ability to pray for the sick. Are you, are you looking at this? He gave them power and authority to be the cure for any ailment on the planet. And he sent them to, pre- now here's another one. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God in the margin or under, under, make a note there, that God's way of doing things. So he sent them to, to proclaim God's way of doing things, God's way of being, and here it is again, and to heal the sick. And he said to them, don't take any with, anything with you on your journey. He said, neither staffs, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and don't even have two tunics apiece. Just the shirt on your back is what you go to. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. Verse 5, and whoever will not receive you when you go, and this is a, listen, this is huge for us, 
Because I think the rejection that most Christians have faced in their life has caused them to wobble. But he said, look, if they reject you, if they don't receive you, when you go out of that city, just shake the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. I mean, Jesus didn't play in here. So they departed and they went through all the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard all that was done by him and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead and he knew that they'd lopped John's head off. And by some that Elijah had reappeared and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. They're trying to put the pieces together and they couldn't figure it out. He said, look, John, I beheaded, but who is this whom I hear such things? So he wanted just to see him. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him that what they had done, and he took them and went aside privately into the deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew, knew it, they followed him. Why? Because here he had 12 guys that were healing everybody. And he, and he received them, and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Again, God's way of doing things. Everybody say God's way of doing things. Say it again. Because the kingdom of God seems so ethereal. It's just the way God does things, the way God speaks, the way God thinks, the way God acts, what God does. And, and he healed those who were in need of healing. When the day began, let me just tell you, there's a, there's a reason today that we're, we're reading this much of Luke 9. It's because there's probably people either watching this right now or in this room right now that need to heal, that need to hear that healing is so readily available. We don't have to wait for Benny Hinn's caravan to come through and we don't have to wait for some of it. No, it's, let me tell you, that power is in all who are filled with the Holy Spirit and believe. That's all it requires. So, so then, I'm gonna, keep, I'm gonna keep reading here in verse 12. When the day began to wear away, the 12 came to him and said, send the multitude away. These guys are starting to grumble. He said, look, send them away. Tell them to go to the, the surrounding towns and the countryside and get, find lodging and provisions for we are in a deserted place. Now think about this. We are in a deserted place. How often do you feel like that in your life? Man, I don't have enough. The enemy's too big. My weapons are too small. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we don't have anything except five loaves and two fish. We, otherwise, we've got to go out and buy something. I don't think we've got enough ready cash to go make this happen. There's 5,000 men here. And then he said this, and it's interesting, because they saw it as this huge, insurmountable task, 5,000 men. There are also women and children there. So you can do the math in your, in your head and try to think about how many people were actually there. So this, this huge crowd of people were there. Jesus saw that that was perplexing to him, how big the issue was. So he said, have them sit down and put them in groups of 50. And they did it. And they made them all sit down. So they all sat down. When they sat down, they became expectant. Let me tell you, your expect, what you expect absolutely matters. You expect things to work out in your life? Man, you find God's promise that causes those things to work out, and they'll work out. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish... And he looked up into heaven, he blessed, and he broke the, the bread, and he gave them the disciples to set before the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and there were even 12 baskets of fragments that were left over. And here's what's interesting. In, in, that, in this passage in chapter 9, 
there were three distinct times where Jesus curtly, Jesus sharply confronted them, corrected them, pruned them. And, 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 and during this time, he even speaks of his death twice. I mean, it's a serious time with those 12 men. And explain to them they'd have to be living sacrifices. Then, listen, these guys had to feel like failures. Here's Jesus bailing them out again and again and again. And then we flip, and verse 46 says that a dispute arose amongst those of which who was going to be the greatest. And he's like, oh my gosh, Jesus was, had to be losing his mind with these guys. And Jesus, perceiving them, what they were thinking about, he took a little child and he set, he, 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 he set the kid by him. And he, he said, whoever receives this little child in my name, like he broke this down, he, he, he put the 5,000 in groups of 50. And he said, whoever receives this little child in my name, whoever receives him who sent me, he receives him who sent me. And then he says, for who is the least among you? Because that's who's gonna be great. See, I'll tell you what, for the last six months with our staff, it's like, man, we've got to celebrate the low-level tasks. We've got to be quick to the low-level tasks. We've got to do it passionately with, with high energy. And we've got to do it every day. And John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and, and, and they weren't even with us, so we forbade them to do so because they weren't following with us. And Jesus said, don't forgive him. For he who isn't against us is for us. See, Jesus is correcting them and correcting them and correcting them. And now flip to chapter 10. This is shocking to me. But I'll tell you, this is where this church is right now. This church is, is in a place right now for, at Luke, the 10th chapter and the first verse. First three words are pivotal. After these things. It was a dumpster fire with those guys. And Jesus said, after these things, what, what happened? He appointed 70 others. 70 others. And he sent them out in pairs. And to, to all the neighboring areas. It, it, it shocks me that after, read verse, read chapter nine, it was a debacle with the 12 disciples. And then Jesus corrected them, pruned them. You know, chapter nine doesn't feel like a win, except they received the pruning. Except they were obedient to the corrections. See, Effective pruning causes growth. I'll tell you, the growth from our revival is going to be evident by the pruning we can receive in our lives. And, and I'll tell you, the tithe, I was thinking about this just yesterday, and I even talked to some people last night. The tithe actually is a financial pruning. And what happens with the tithe? God opens up the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing so great we're unable to receive it. See, getting in the Word first thing in your day is actually a pruning. Man, you're not, you're not going to where your flesh wants to go immediately. See, serving others is actually social pruning. Coaching, training, mentoring is professional pruning. See, the Word prunes us. Faith prunes our fear. But see, the way our fear is pruned, it's just, it's just like what, listen, it's what Herod did with John the Baptist. What did he do? He cut off his head. He pruned him. What happened? Jesus. He's like, whoa, wait a minute. What's going on here? We can't stop this. Some of you guys feel like, man, I'm, I'm paring things back. It's going to affect my business. Yeah. 
But if you're allowing the Holy Spirit, if you're, if you're hearing from God and you're pairing things back, and, you, and listen, I'm just telling you, it's going to cause growth. And in, in Psalm 8410, one day in his house is better than a thousand elsewhere. One day. See, it's not, it's not how much we can abandon. It's the right things that we abandon. It's the right decisions. It's the right pruning that we receive. And see, I, I, I think that, that if, you, if you could go back and look at, if you could go back and look at Luke 9 and Luke 10, because God, I'm telling you, God's a consuming fire. And, and, and us allowing our lives just to be pruned a little bit. I'll tell you, back in the late 80s, I quit reading Sports Illustrated. Sandy and I were in ministry. I, I, I hate to tell some of you guys this, there was no internet. What do you do? That magazine came to the mailbox every Friday. And sometimes on Thursdays, I'd get the mail and be like, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. It came a day early, but it came on Fridays. Man, I had that thing read cover to cover by the time I went to bed on Friday night. And you know, I started getting convicted about it. And you might laugh at that. But see, it's little things like that in our life. See, because the only thing that I can give is what I already have. And I want to honor God. Anybody with me want to honor God? So I have to have that in my life. See, internal victory is faith, and it moves into our circumstances. Man, if, you're, if your circumstance is a bad diagnosis or a bad report, man, that faith on the inside of you is going to rise up, and it's going to overcome. See, faith is the most normal expression in our lives now. And we, we, we're thinking faith. My God's able. I've got nothing to fear. I don't, I don't wor- I'm not anxious for anything. I don't worry saying, man, if, if, if a little bit of anxiety comes in my life, I'm not going to speak. And that we've got to see, but we've got to be able, just like Jesus, what he said, speak to that mountain, speak to that tree. The tree, it, it, it's like it was nothing. Except for the world, those trees in our life that aren't producing any fruit, it's, it's confusing to the world. So you speak to that mountain. You speak to that tree. Let me tell you, if you're effective speaking at a tree, you're going to be effective speaking at a, at a storm. And, and that's the point today. The point today is so much of this life, it feels like, oh my gosh, God's paring me back and God's pruning me. And I'll tell you, I believe the reason there's a pruning going on in our lives right now is because there is a massive harvest that God's called us to. I, I really do believe that. And, and it, it, if I were one of the guys that would talk about the end times, I'd be talking about it right now. But I'm telling you, with the end times comes this massive revival and a massive harvest. And it's like, that's what I think about. That's what I'm looking for. That's why I believe your future is bright. You know why? The Bible says, man, that it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter till the noonday. And then night comes when no man can work. Well, let me tell you, it's not night right now. Man, I see God everywhere. Do you? I see God moving on my behalf, on your behalf, everywhere. Man, the people that I talk to, man, see Matt, see Jaime, see Chano, see Jeff, see Chris. Man, see Andy. Man, it's all, it's all, oh my gosh, I've got to handle this growth. I've got to get this harvest in. Man, if any of you guys are young guys here and you're thinking, man, what am I going to do with my life? Man, find one of these guys that, that own businesses and that are entrepreneurial and just go hook your wagon to them. Don't even ask them for a job. Just show up. I'm not kidding you. Make coffee in their office. How do you take your coffee? And Chris, Chris got the COVID, so he started drinking coffee for a while. But now he's, he's done with the COVID, so he doesn't like coffee again. He couldn't taste it. 
No, I've known him for 20 years, and I see him, he's drinking coffee. I said, man, you he's grown up. He's a man now. You're drinking coffee. He goes, yeah, I can't taste it. This is awesome. I don't know if that's public, but it is now. See, and understand this is that there's parts of our life that are bulletproof. The parts that we allow God to prune in our lives makes us bulletproof. All the rest of it, we're open game. And I'll just tell you this, the authority that we have keeps us from being soft targets. We're not soft targets. God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you sent your word and healed us and delivered us of our destructions. God, that in us, all the families of the the earth will be blessed. God, I proclaim blessing upon every household in this room in the name of Jesus. I take authority over loneliness right now and depression in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just allow that to be released in your life. Man, I I sat out with these guys after breakfast one day this week and And this guy said, Pastor, sit down. You got a word for me? And I said, yeah, I do. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Where two of you is touching anything agree. And they're looking at me. I'm I'm like, look, it's Matthew 18. Write that down and just meditate on that today. And you see what happens. There's things in your life, I'm telling you by the Spirit of God right now, that you have to bind. There's attitudes you have, you have to bind. And then you know what? Man, you lose all the blessings of God in your life and you see what happens. Is there anybody in your your life's not right with God? Anybody that needs to make Jesus Lord of their life? Anybody at all? The Bible says we believe in our heart unto righteousness and we confess with our mouth unto salvation. The Bible says anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That word saved is rescued, restored, made whole with nothing missing and nothing broken. Man, you you might be here today and you need to be rescued or restored or made whole. That's probably all of us. So let's all pray together. We believe in our heart and righteousness. We confess with our mouth of salvation. Let's all proclaim this today. God, I thank you today. I'm a new, say it again. God, I thank you today. I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. God, I thank you. I'm created in Christ Jesus for great works because Jesus is Lord of my life. God, I call heaven on earth today. Heaven in my home. Heaven in my friends. Heaven in my church. God, I have the authority to trample over all the power of the evil one. And nothing, absolutely nothing, will any, by any means harm me. What the enemy's meant for bad God turns to good. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in to Guts Church YouTube channel. I'm Pastor Chano Trevino, the assistant pastor here at Guts Church. And on behalf of our leadership team, our staff, our church, it's our hope that this message met you right where you are. If it did, I bet there's someone you know who could use the encouragement of this message in their life. And you sharing it with them can make all the difference. The mission of Guts Church is to help people win. And you can be a part of that simply by sharing, or better yet, inviting someone to tune into Guts Church online with you every week. Take that next step to be a part of what God is doing right now in this moment in time by being committed to showing up, placing a premium on God's word, and receiving all that God has for you. You can share this message, gather your friends for services, make it a priority to make this the place you want to be. God has so much for you. I truly believe that. We love you. We're praying for you. Can't wait to see you soon.